I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's professionalism meeting. Um, we're we're uh, so happy that uh, Dr. Vinnie Aurora it will, will join us uh, to speak today. Uh, Dr. Aurora uh, is an associate professor of medicine and an associate program director of the Internal Medicine Residency Program. Uh, she's also an assistant dean for the, uh, for the program on scholarship and discovery uh, at Pritzker. Um, as many of you know, uh, those of you who have uh, heard Dr. Aurora speak at other times and have worked with her, um, her, her academic interests focus on uh, broadly uh, improving the learning environment um, for medical students and, and medical residents and on improving the quality of care uh, that, that we provide to patients. Um, uh, she's published on topics such as the care of elderly hospitalized patients, medical professionalism, sleep deprivation, the, the, the handoff problem as, as residents rotate uh, and pass on the care of patients to others. Today, uh, and I, I love this topic, today uh, Dr. Aurora is going to speak on oh, I, wonderful topic. <laughs> it, uh, it's called The Good Old Days, Evidence of Old World Professionalism in Modern Day Residency Trainees. Vinny. As we talk about um, resident duty hours, which is really one of the most contentious topics I think I've ever um, spoken about. Um, I expect to inspire some controversy in the room and inspired by other talks that I've been at that have ended controversially. I <laughs> hope to also equally end controversially. Um, and so, um, let's see, does this work? So the outline for today's talk is, uh, as uh, given in the title, we're going to talk about the old world definition of professionalism and how that meets the challenges of the new world. I'm going to sp focus specifically on residency training, um, but some of what I uh, described certainly applies to the students in the audience, especially uh, those fourth year students, um, including my advisees. You better turn in your rank list tonight. It's due today. So, um, so the challenges of the new world with shift work mentality. Um, and then I want to specifically focus on data that we've collected, three specific stories that highlight resident work ethic with work hours. So how are residents really handling this tension between old world professionalism and the challenges of the new world? And I hope to end with um, some the need for an evolution in the dialogue about professionalism as it relates to residency trainees. So um, some of you probably can recite this by heart, including me and some of my colleagues. Um, but I, I know that the Ethics Conference draws a large audience. And so I just wanted to highlight some background, quick background of how we got here with residency duty hours. And so in 1984, Libby Zion, who was the daughter of Sidney Zion, who was a powerful um, um, editor and um, you know involved in the New York Times, the, her, his daughter died in a New York hospital, an academic New York hospital, of a preventable adverse event. Um, and in an investigation of that event, uh, Dr. Bertrand Bell was asked to chair a blue ribbon panel um, titled the Bell Commission that issued a report. And on the top of that report, they issued all of the, uh, examined all of the root causes that led to her death. And I'm not going to get into the specifics, but it's a fascinating story. The number one thing that actually was um, cited was um, inadequate supervision of um, residents and interns in the night um, who were making medical decisions. And then later on in, in, uh, in their 18 comments that they made, they also highlighted fatigue and resident fatigue because they were working very long hours. Needless to say, the things that got picked up from that report and translated into policy really focused on fatigue and very little until recently has focused on some of the other areas. And so this led to 1989, the New York State Code 405, this is the Department of Health Code, um, actually revision um, to state that residents uh, could no longer work more than 24-hour shifts in New York. Um, and that was implemented early in New York, which then led to congressional um, demands for investigation of this issue. One of the most powerful um, people who would, um, who would advocate for this is Representative Conyers. Um, 
which then led the ACGME, the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education, which is located here in Chicago and accredits residency programs, to, under federal pressure, under the threat of federal pressure, to regulate duty hours by, um, by first mandating um, an 80-hour work week, as well as a maximum shift of 30 hours for residents. Um, and this was done in 2003, which is the year after I finished my chief residency, uh, which was at Pitt pivotal in my uh, research and educational career. Um, and between 2003 and 2008, we were under the system of the 2003 duty hour regulations. And I'm going to show some data about how people responded to the duty hour regulations during this time. But then, because the 2003 rules still called for um, um, shifts of up to 30 hours, which were considered marathon shifts, a community of sleep researchers as well as patient safety advocates were very effective in lobbying Congress to reconvene um, folks to investigate this issue. And so on behest of Congress, the Institute of Medicine actually investigated the issue and issued a report on resident duty hours actually stating that all residents should work no more than 16 hours. So needless to say, the responses from medicine to the Institute of Medicine report uh, were very vocal and um, uniformly negative. And there were letters and, um, and a variety of different petitions sent to the ACGME calling for ro more robust evidence than what existed, as well as delay of any standard implementation based on the Institute of Medicine report. So I do want to highlight what do patients think in all this, because this is a question that sometimes is asked, and I know as uh, the McLean Center often thinks about doctor-patient relations, you know, what, what do patients think about this? Well, it's hard to get your handle around that question, but there is a website called wakeupdoctor.org, which is actually a website of 40 patient advocacy groups that claim to represent the public. Um, and so often when Congress, you know, wants to know what the public way feels, they'll go to this website. Website. And they highlight on their website, new research finds that only 1% of the general public supports widespread practice of resident physicians working shifts longer than 24 hours. This was a telephone survey done by Harvard sleep researchers that is somewhat contentious for a variety of reasons because when they ask the public on the phone what, um, you know, whether or not they would like a, their doctor to work 24 hours, it was, le it was led by a prologue that said currently the, you know, the residents are working very long hours, and it didn't highlight any of the trade-offs or the consequences of having a doctor who's unfamiliar with your care. And most people can understand being tired is bad, and so you can understand why nobody wants to have a tired doctor. They also go on to use a little bit of sensationalism. You've seen them on Scrubs, ER, and Grey's Anatomy, deeply fatigued interns and residents, but truth is stranger than fiction. So I highlight the difficulty in getting the actual public to weigh in on this issue. So um, under the threat of federal regulation, once again, the ACGME actually in 2010 issued their new recommendations for duty hours. And this is the uh, paper that was issued in the New England Journal of Medicine by Tom Nasca, who's the current CEO of the ACGME and his colleagues. Um, and, and one thing that was interesting is um, they actually issued a rule that was somewhat controversial. Um, instead of adopting the IOM's recommendations for 16 hours for all residents, they they actually examined the data and heard reams of testimony. And the 16-hour study is actually based on one study done in a Harvard ICU of a group of under 20 medical interns. And so that is the data for which we have a 16-hour um, that shows that attentional failures and medical errors went up in the group that was working longer than 16 hours. And so they decided to institute a 16-hour shift for PGY1s only, because that's where the data existed, but to continue to allow PGY2s and above to work a marathon shift, 24 plus 4 hours. They shortened it slightly. Um, and, um, and the idea being that there was still this concern of resident experience. Um, they also issued a few other recommendations related to night float and strategic napping. 
And so since then, the dialogue regarding um, resident duty hours, I mean, we could talk all day and all night about whether the ACGME should or should not restrict duty hours or whether, you know, what we feel about it. But the truth of the matter is, I think all of us have realized in medical education that duty hours are here to stay. And it is a part of the culture now of residency training. And so a more nuanced question is, how does duty hours affect the evolving dialogue around professionalism? Well, to answer this question, um, it's important to go to the literature. And actually, it was at this conference that I was introduced to this uh, diagram, which is uh, part of uh, Fred Hafferty's work on professionalism and highlights the seven competing clusters of professionalism. And one of those clusters, the first cluster, is nostalgic professionalism. And so in nostalgic professionalism, um, the values that are, um, that are weighted are autonomy, altruism, professional dominance, the social contract, and social justice at the expense of things like lifestyle. Now, um, another competing cluster, and the one that I'm going to talk about the most, is called, is dubbed lifestyle professionalism, which Hafferty and colleagues um, actually state this is the new generation of what uh, our trainees espouse to be, to have healthy balance and espouse lifestyle professionalism. So uh, while autonomy is still valued, things like lifestyle and personal morality actually outweigh things like the social contract and social justice. So whether or not you agree with whether, uh, you know, what these competing clusters are, I will highlight that um, the responses that you have regarding duty hours and that the community has around duty hours do frame nicely with this nostalgic versus lifestyle um, competing clusters. So um, this is actually what I would dub the nostalgic response. And this is actually seminal work that was published by um, an old friend of our institution, Charles Bosk, who actually, um, with Kevin Vogt, Vope at the University of Pennsylvania and two graduate students embedded themselves at, at the University of Pennsylvania watching residents um, as they were um, carrying out their duties to better understand, do residents have shift work mentality? Do they look at the clock? Do they want to leave? And what are the kind of um, issues that they face? Um, and in their study, they reviewed a lot of faculty responses as well. And so they highlight some faculty responses, which I would argue are the nostalgic response. Residents feel like more like clocked employees, less like professionals. It's not my patient. We've heard that quite a bit. Uh, we have diminished a profession that took great pride in total devotion to patient care to one where the time clock rules whether to finish a task, the patient be damned. So really strong opinions. You also hear about people describing this competing cluster of lifestyle in a very negative way. 80-hour work weeks in residency will make lifestyle an important consideration for these individuals. Um, they will be less inclined to make themselves available for emergency call in hospitals and less likely to choose rural or solo practice. And obviously that has major policy implications in the setting of the Affordable Care Act and a short, nationwide shortage of physicians. Now, that were just some, those were just some excerpts from one institution. So what do people think around the country? And so Darcy Reed and colleagues have actually surveyed um, key clinical faculty in internal medicine over the phone regarding duty hours. And in a big study that they looked at regarding you know, the impact of education, they also specifically asked about resident professionalism. And in all four domains that they looked at, accountability, ability to place patients' needs above self-interest, the resident patient relationship and resident professionalism overall, you see that the faculty were more likely to report a decrease, that they believe that duty hours were going to de were decreasing resident professionalism. And this study was done actually shortly after the implementation of the 2003 duty hours. Now, do we have more recent data? Well, in, um, I'm actually uh, part of the Aptum Survey Committee, which um, surveys all internal medicine program directors on a periodic basis. And duty hours is one of their favorite topics. And so, um, so we ask similar questions. And from the 2009 data representing all um, representing a big chunk of um, program directors in internal medicine, we see that most internal medicine program directors strongly believe that, um, that professional ownership of patients decreases with resident duty hours. 
So we, we see some data that suggests that faculty leaders involved with training and program directors are really concerned about resident professionalism um, in the setting of duty hours. And so one question that I've been struggling with is, have residents truly embraced lifestyle professionalism? And, um, and, what, and if so, how have they done that? Um, and so to answer this question, again, we go to the literature. And what's interesting in a study done by Nita Retan Wugusa and colleagues at Johns Hopkins University is, um, is that she highlights that actually residents continue to value um, the old world professionalism values like altruism, self-awareness, most of the principles they actually place a very high importance on to their practice. The challenge that they face is actually putting those principles into daily practice. Um, so they have this tension. They, they want to adhere to these values, but they have a problem putting them into practice. And um, here's a great example from this, um, this study of how do they, why do they have this problem. I would like to spend as much time as I felt needed informing patients, families with diagnoses, tests, especially new diagnoses. But sometimes I need to cut short the discussion as I need to get out or finish my work, though I feel like this is part of my work. So really expressing the tension. Now, also in this study, they specifically asked residents about duty hours and professionalism. And what's interesting is that um, at least some of the residents highlighted that they thought duty hours did indeed affect their professionalism. So similar to the quote that we just saw, less time to talk with patients or families, uh, time pressure in general, continuity was reduced, and professional accountability as well. But there was also a similar fraction that thought that resident duty hours would promote professionalism. So the lifestyle argument, less fatigue, more teamwork, um, per, per, uh, personal well-being, being less tired. And so the lifestyle response was echoed in this study by a variety of individuals that said, residents feeling toxic leads to poor professionalism. Grumpy, lack of sympathy, not wanting to take time for shared decisions with patients, thus better rest leads to more professional behavior. And another resident, being overworked and tired makes it hard to act graciously. And I think most of us can also agree with these comments as well. Now, that was simply one institution again and one group of residents, and that was also done shortly after the uh, resident duty hours. And so interestingly, there's been little data nationwide from residents. We've surveyed program directors a lot. We've surveyed faculty a lot. But then the question is, what do residents really think about this issue? Now, we were fortunate to partner with the American College of Physicians. Um, they administer the in-training exam that actually goes to all residents in the fall of their residency. And on that in-training exam were embedded some questions regarding duty hours that were asked of the program directors. And so with Elizabeth Pash, who's one of our hospitalist fellows here, we've been analyzing some of this data, which comes from over 12,000 residents. And what's interesting is that it's not as easy to say, OK, all residents are concerned about professionalism. There's actually some interesting variation where PGY3s express greater concern about the impact of duty hours on professionalism ownership than PGY2s and PGY1s. And so one, um, one thought there is perhaps that they're more entrenched in the old version of training. And when this came out, they're still clinging to the nostalgic professionalism. Um, now, the other argument could be maybe they know more and they know the untoward effects of duty hours. But interestingly, there's some other interesting findings that we're still teasing out. And I just want to highlight that it's not an easy story. So US medical grads are also more concerned about duty hours than international medical grads. And this may be the case because many other countries have already limited duty hours, um, although some of the most the most po um, common pipeline countries that send residents to this country actually do not have limits. So it's still a little bit unclear. Another competing explanation is that international medical grads who are concerned about saying anything negative about the program or giving up their spot may not want to say anything negative about resident duty hours. Um, and so interestingly, and this is more hot off the presses, um, residents who are graduating out of university-based programs are also more concerned about the effect of resident duty hours on professionalism than those in community programs. And that may speak to specific tensions that those of us in university hospitals face. 
And then um, there's something different about the Northeast than the rest of the country. And, um, and I don't know what it is, but I think a big explanation could be that New York has already had duty hours for a very long time. And so those in New York, which, in co which actually um, holds one quarter of all residency spots in the nation, so they're a powerful block. Um, so the New Yorkers may be driving this, and they may say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. We've had it for a while. And that may speak to the fact that, um, that perhaps with time, maybe people will feel differently about how resident duty hours affect this. Also, a, a lot of international medical graduates in that New York cohort. Yes, and even these, uh, these I should add that these um, associations hold up even when controlling for the others. Um, so, so have residents embraced lifestyle professionalism? Well, so far in my review, I have not seen any conclusive evidence that they've completely embraced it. And they still demonstrate high professional accountability towards patients. And moreover, they express a grave concern about duty hours. And what's perhaps the most interesting is that those that are further along in residency express greater concern than those are just, who are just beginning residency. So um, now moving on to the next, next example that I want to highlight, which is one of the big concerns with shift work mentality or lifestyle professionalism is people will literally become watching the clock and you know, leaving the hospital. So my next question is, do residents do this, watch the clock and leave the hospital on time? And uh, you can probably um, guess what the answer to this is, but I want to take you through an interesting article about what we have forced residents to do, which is, um, which is this leave or lie quandary. We now force them to leave a patient with whose treatment they're intimately involved or to cease learning, in this example, surgery midstream. And one of my favorite quotes is, although we have added professionalism as a training goal, we gave our trainees the choice between abandoning a patient and lying. And so get faced with these two choices, what do they do? And so my first question is, do residents lie? And in fact, in studies, roughly 50% of US surgical trainees in one study have reported lying about duty hours. Um, obviously, it's difficult to collect this type of data. Um, uh, but I do want to highlight that we are not alone. So the European Union, which actually mandates a 48-hour work week for its residents or junior doctors, and actually I should say it mandates a 48-hour work week for everyone, all workers, which is why I think we should move there, um, <laughs> but, um, but has actually uh, been in place now for some time. And this is policed by the... Um, their health service. And actually, here's a headline from their news, like from their CNN. Um, NHS urging junior doctors to lie about <laughs> hours to comply with EU laws. And this is not alone. Multiple scandals have been reported where um, EU physicians, junior doctors, are, are basically being told by the hospital to just you know, make it sound like you're working under 48 hours. Um, or there have been other creative solutions. For example, when um, David and I visited Ireland, um, I was surprised to learn that the, when I talked to the residents that they were there all day and all night and working more than we were, in fact, more than our residents were, and that they were having the same issues. And I said, well, what about the, these European Union laws? And they were like, oh, yeah, that's by the UK, and you know those guys are soft. Here in Ireland, we're tough. <laughs> and every country has a different response. And our country's response is to say that there are service hours and there are educational hours, and that's acceptable. And so we have 48-hour service hours, but additional 20 to 30 educational hours. And so um, I highlight that not everything is as as it seems. So the next question is, do residents leave the hospital? And this is easy data to look at because we can look at compliance with the ACGME rules. Now, the best data we have is actually a nationwide study that was done the year after the implementation of the 2003 rules by Chris Landergan and colleagues at Harvard. And Chris Landergan is the same one that led the 16-hour ICU study um, that looked at intentional failures and medical errors. And uh, in this nation, nationally representative sample of residents, um, he would ask them by month to report on logs you know, how often they exceeded their duty hour limits. At the time, this was the 80 hour and the 30 hour. And what's interesting is that the 80 hour was rarely violated. It was more often the 30 hour rule that was violated. But as you can see, it was uh, roughly half reporting every month, and with maybe a slight trend for more in July when it was first introduced. Um, and if you take it all together over the year, 88% of residents reported that they had um, gone over their hours at some point. Now, you might be interested to know that during the same time, noncompliance with duty hours reported by the ACGME um, 
or to the ACGME, I should say, was 3%. And so you might be wondering, how is there such a big difference? And obviously, residents um, may have been more honest with um, the researchers in this study than they are on the ACGME survey or to the ACGME. But the other thing is it's also the method that's important. Um, the method by which uh, the study measured noncompliance was any noncompliance, any shift, any time you went over, which is a very high bar. And when you ask people at the ACGME who actually police duty hours, you know, what do they think about this, they will actually tell you that they're more concerned about the average. And then the way they ask the questions on the survey is, on average, how often are, are you exceeding your duty hours? So there is the idea that there could be an exceptional case where you need to stay and there's something going on that um, that requires a attention but if it's a minor thing that only happens once it's not going to get counted and so in order to put programs under um, um, under, uh, under, to say programs are non-compliant, they very much have to be violating duty hours on a consistent basis. Now, the discrepancy between 88% um, and 3% or 50%, no matter how you cut it, is still very large. And so there's probably still some element of not truthful reporting going on. So why do residents not leave? Um, so this is actually in the discussion of this paper, but I will also add, we can all add our own anecdotal experiences. Um, I myself have personally escorted residents out of the hospital. Um, it happens actually more often in July or August. Um, it seems to be more common with residents than interns. Um, but why is that? Well, the first is maybe a systems issue, uh, which is that we do not yet have systems in place for residents to depart on time due to a variety of barriers. The ACGME mandates are unfunded. And so how are hospitals going to meet those uh, demands? Um, who is going to pick up the work? Are residents going to just abandon their work when the clock ends? And more importantly, have we really adjusted workload to meet, um, to meet the work shifts that we've created? I'm not going to show the data, but in data we have actually reviewed elsewhere um, using some of our own data collected here. If an intern admits five new patients in a 24-hour period in July, they are universally always going to violate the 30-hour rule. Now, this was before the 16-hour rule went in place, and that was the cap. So we've set them up to fail if we have a five, uh, five admission cap. So one question is, should we adjust the system to design shifts where residents are successful and can leave on time? And oftentimes what Tom Naska at the ACGME always says is, you know, in, in uh, medicine, we schedule everyone to the max. We schedule everyone to leave at 1 p.m. And if they leave at 1 p.m., it doesn't give them proper time for a handoff. And if the new person's coming at 1 p.m., you already know there's gonna, the person's not going to leave um, the hospital until 1.30 or 2. Now, that's one issue. And the systems issues, I think, were, you know, they're going to take time to solve, and people are working on them. But the, the harder issue to solve is professional culture, which is, is there this implicit desire for faculty willing them to stay or saying, oh, back in my day? And so perhaps they're getting this message that, you know, it's strong work to stay. And I will tell one story about my own residency, which was without duty hours, was uh, when I had a patient, one of our patients, who um, my intern called me and said, this patient on um, the Hemonc service is having the worst headache of their life. And I thought, okay, that's really not a usual t way to describe a headache. So we went to go evaluate the patient. And having said that he had the worst headache of his life, this was now 5 o'clock, and we were preparing our sign-out, of course, and we were on call the next day. And so we decided to stay and work up the patient and took the patient, wheeled them ourselves to get um, a non-contrast head CT, which was positive for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So then we called neurovascular uh, angiogram, um, and then neurosurgery. The patient went to neurosurgery to get their aneurysm clipped. So I walked out of the hospital and went to the parking garage, I think sometime after midnight, to come back at 7 a.m. to start my call in which there was no 30 hours um, and I had called my attending who is Dr. Olapati and uh, and the next morning when I arrived uh, my intern came in a little bit late because she was obviously tired and uh, we had started rounding and my my attending Dr. Olapati looked at me and she said strong work and so I knew I had done a good job now this was back in the old days and so I highlight that to think uh, I when I heard that I thought Okay, I'm horribly tired, but I did it, you know? And so um, 
Another follow-up to this story is that I actually saw the patient who later was in the ER with, um, with, a, with one of his family members, um, and he remembered me. So this was a year later I saw him, and he was like, thank you for saving my life. And so there are those moments in medicine where you do stay because there is the patient in front of you that needs help. Now, the key, though, is so what do we do? Are house staff unwilling to leave? Is it the faculty that are kind of sending this message? Or is it the house staff at that setting, like we chose personally to be like, we're not signing this over to CrossCover. We're going to stay and work this up. Now, this is a question that I've explored with some of our uh, residents here um, back in 2003, shortly after the initial duty hours went into place. And what we did was we gave residents um, the opportunity, interns, the opportunity to have night float coverage for protected sleep time. And this was at a time when everyone was deciding, should residents work shorter shifts, or should we try to provide naps in the middle of shifts so residents can continue to um, ha provide continuity of care the following day? So using our paging system, we were able to download paging um, logs and find out when people left the hospital, and also how many pages they got at night, as well as did they actually sign over their pager? Did they use night float? And what's interesting is that in our study, despite providing them with this safe time to sign out, a resident who was um, available to provide this night float, and they were going to be in the call room to get some sleep, and they knew that they could get more sleep if they did this, interns signed out only 22% of the time. And we actually know from data that you know, for each page that they got, they were less likely to get sleep, roughly 10 minutes. And so why did they not use it? So this was probably the most interesting thing to me and led to my work in handoffs, because it was the fear of the handoff that led to them not to want to give away their professional ownership. And how did they describe this? Well, I keep my patients even though I could get more sleep if I signed out completely because I want to know what happens to my patients. Again, the professional ownership issues. And then even more um, interesting was I worry that, of course, when it's not one of your own patients, you tend to be less aggressive. So highlighting that by signing out to a cross-covering physician who doesn't feel that same professional ownership, they're putting their patient at harm. And so they're afraid to do, to do these handoffs, and that's why they're, they're choosing to work even longer. And so what do we know? Well, residents certainly have difficulty leaving the hospital. They express wanting to care, continuing care for patients. But we also have systems that are set up that do not promote leaving. And sometimes they're forced to lie about the hours that they worked to keep their uh, residency program um, from not suffering. So my next question is, well, Residents have to leave the hospital, and sometimes we personally escort them out. So what do they do when they're not at work? And this actually question is inspired by residents themselves. Um, I was recently, uh, about a year ago, I was talking to one of our current residents, who was then an intern, who said, you know, Dr. Aurora, we actually go home and continue to look online at the record. And, um, and it's, it's this thing we call epic stalking, where we're just stalking the patient from home. And, um, and, and sometimes we reach in and you know write orders and you know sometimes we call the cross cover and we may even call the patient in the room to confirm some interesting <laughs> findings that we looked up and I thought oh my god this is kind of crazy because I thought I just did that but I'm the attending so that's okay and so um, so you'll be surprised to know that the ACGME in 2011 in all of their standards regarding duty hours actually says that they require programs to ensure residents manage their time before during and after clinical assignments. So this is a very lofty goal for programs. Um, you know, we're going to be ma managing what people are doing out of the hospital. And any tasks related to performance of duties, even if performed at home, count towards the 80 hours. Now, I can tell you in um, sitting as a fly on the wall in some of the discussions at the program director's meeting, there is a vehement pushback to this um, discussion. And um, the other thing that I will say about this is that there is an ongoing companion discussion as to how we should be monitoring this because programs right now are universally not monitoring this. Um, and so what our residents did, on um, this was work led by Rod Diano and Ali Dikoski, um, where, where they created a survey that they used at two hospitals um, here and at one of our affiliates to look at how often residents are doing this. And in fact, residents, we just simply asked, how often do you do this? And think about it for your last inpatient rotation. And it turns out that residents frequently are checking labs, um, and especially on their post-call day, they're often reviewing records. And 37% are ordering inpatient labs from home 
on their post call day, as well as dictating discharge summaries. And we're not alone in a UCSF study where they actually looked at the time um, of discharge summary dictations. They determined that 50% of them are dictated when residents are out of the hospital. Um, and I should highlight that this is a, um, a this is actually something that has only become possible through the electronic health record, this level of monitoring. I do remember during my residency, some people would call the lab, um, and Jeannie's laughing because we have shared this story, where some residents we know would, from home, call the lab to find out what the labs were, but they would physically have to call different people to find out things, or call the medical resident on call to ask them to look up things about their patient. Um, so this is now much easier. So what about communication from home? <laughs> well, um, and this picture is actually Michael Douglas. I was recently watching Wall Street thinking how far we've come from cell phones and so um, so um, so a significant time is uh, spent communicating with the team I mean one of the largest things that residents do is communicate corral people and so they're often emailing or texting their resident paging their cross cover emailing the attending and this was probably the most surprising to me was calling the ward patient so half of residents said they did this at least once a month from home and 20% said they did it on their post call day at least once during that during that um, rotation, and so you can just imagine what kind of conversations lead to you calling and ringing the unit clerk to put you through to the patient. Um, but to highlight that basically a lot of communication is going on, and another thing is paging the cross cover team. Two thirds of residents said that they did that at least once, with 40 percent on their post call day. So highlighting that they're not abandoning their post; they are thinking about things and continuing to call back and perhaps um, advance care. Now what about that day off? So the ACGME mandates one in seven have a day off. A, one out of every seven days is a day off. It's not average, so it's, it's an average. It's not a mandatory. Um, it's, so basically it's averaged over the course of the month. A resident must have four days off. Um, and so, so when we ask residents, you know, do you come to work on your day off? And this was actually, have you done this once during the year? 45% uh, had reported at least coming in once during their day off. And mostly it was for educational activities. Now this was before the 16-hour rule. Anecdotally, I have seen interns who are off in the hospital coming to reports, et cetera. And that has placed program directors in a, in a variety of, a, um, in a sort of a, a controversial situation because you know somebody's off and they shouldn't be there, but it doesn't feel right to be like, please go home and don't receive education. And so, um, so most program directors I know who I've talked to about this have sort of turned a blind eye or have said, you're, you're on your own and we're, we're, if you're here for your education, that's fine. And similar, I didn't show this data, but a lot of them are doing research Research, Al, it's reassuring. Many of them are reading. They're going home on their post call day to read about the cases, and perhaps that's why they're spending time calling back and thinking about things. So interestingly, residents, again, do this more than interns. Residents work from home to prepare conference. That makes sense. But they're also more likely to call their cross-cover team post-call as well as email the attending. So being the team leader, they take greater responsibility. Or there may be something about the resident where they're the ones who are actively doing, feeling more responsible in doing this. So why do residents work from home? And this was actually a follow-up study led by two of our residents, Scott Siglin and David Cork. Um, um, and we expanded to um, one other institution in Chicago. So this is three Chicago institutions, similar findings from before. 81% reported they work from home to monitor a patient's progress. And then 65% to complete unfinished work. And so that's concerning because that leads to the fact that the shift may not be designed correctly where they have to transfer a lot of work out of the hospital. Um, and I didn't show this data, but less than 10% state it's because their program expects them to or that faculty expect them to. So they're really doing this on their own. It's something that they feel they should do, as highlighted by the following. 88% said the ability and skill to work from home is useful for future practice. Um, and actually, in follow-up studies that one of our merits fellows and hospital scholars, Shannon Martin, is completing um, with interviews, she's examining attending culture and practice regarding working from home and looking at the electronic um, health record and supervision. So we may have more data on this in the future. So do residents work from home? Clearly the answer is yes, and why? It's because they want to monitor a patient's progress and not because the program expects them to. 
And they believe it's an important skill for future practice. And I think all of the attendings in the room would not argue with that statement. Um, and so the question is, what do we do about it? So this is going to be a big issue for the ACGME to deal with. Do we start monitoring it? There have been discussions about whether we should restrict privileges um, through the electronic health record for residents. Um, and so should we uh, enable people to order labs from home? Um, the only problem with that comes up, which I didn't show you, is that the bulk of managing clinics continuity clinic, one third of residency in internal medicine is continuity clinic, is all managed at home. And mostly it's done when you're on inpatient on the post-call day. So you finish up post-call, you go home, you know, maybe rest, figure out what's going on with your patients, and then you catch up on your clinic patients before you go forward. And so, and then interestingly, residents are more likely to pr exhibit these behaviors than interns. So highlighting the similar theme that there's something about residency training that, um, that actually gives them this, um, inculcates this value. Okay, so the next question is, what do residents do when they should not work? There are times when we all fall ill. I noticed somebody was just sneezing, and I know that some of you are sick, and I was sick recently, and um, I did come to work. Um, and so the question is, what do residents do when they should not work? Now, this was inspired by actually this photo here, which is a picture of the H1N1 virus with its um, fuzzy coats. And, um, and I think some of you may remember that during that time, we had a really um, difficult time managing the, um, the internal epidemic of H1N1 because there were residents who were coming to work sick and at times some of our hospital epidemiologists had to go up to certain patient care areas and physically remove people from their work post and say that you are sick. And so this was not just here, um, but it was elsewhere. But this inspired um, one of our medical students who was in a MD, PhD program, um, the MESH training program that David runs, um, um, Bapu Jaina, to actually investigate this issue further in residency. And so, um, so this is called presenteeism, and this is coming to work when you're sick. So that, that's what I like about Peterson. He doesn't let a little illness keep him off the job. As you can see, he's got his IV there. So, um, so what, um, what Bapu did was we partnered with the ACGME, and they were already collecting data from 12 hospitals, 537 residents, and they had questions about whether these residents had come to work sick. Um, and actually, um, interestingly, um, the question was, have you ever come to work sick at least once during the year? And 60% of residents had reported coming to work sick at least once during the year. Um, now, interestingly, again, residents were more likely than interns to report coming to work sick, 62% versus 52% in this study. And this was only PGY2s versus PGY1. So these weren't the most senior residents, but something about being a resident made you more likely to come to work sick. And when you examine literature in other industries about presenteeism, especially nursing and other things, it turns out, like, you know, one question is why do residents um, espouse a higher professional obligation of patient care? And one interesting thing that um, other studies have shown is that workers who believe their work and their that themselves are not easily replaced by others are more likely to come to work when they're sick. And so this may be related to why the resident, the team leader who feels like they have more obligation, they not only have an obligation to the patients, but they might feel that their um, judgment may be hard to substitute for. Um, and so this may also apply to attendings who, you know, rarely will take a day off of work from their sick when they're on inpatient service. So in a follow-up study, and this was actually done with Val Press, who's here, um, and others looking at Chicago hospitals um, and looking at a convenient sample of residents who attended the American College of Physicians meeting, we simply didn't, we had the ACGME data, but the unanswered question was why. We just knew that they did come to work sick, but we didn't know why. Was it because they didn't have a Jeopardy system in place? Was it because their program didn't have time off? And it turns out that um, the top reason was actually concern for their college. They did not want to force their colleagues to cover. Um, so obviously feeling, um, you know, uh, compassion towards their colleagues. But the, the half, the second reason, felt responsibility to care for their patients. So again, this, um, what, and in the article that we described, um, the JAMA editors wanted us to write misplaced professionalism as the, uh, as the reason for, for this. And so I highlight that just to say that, you know, there is a lot of controversy as to whether this is a good thing. Um, and then afraid other physicians would think they were weak. This was only 15%. So mostly it was regarding uh, wor a worry about your colleagues as well as professional responsibility. 
Now, in this study, we also looked at what sort of adverse consequences might occur. And this is very interesting. Roughly 10% of the residents in this sample thought they personally made a patient sick by coming to work sick. But they were also stated that, again, it's not me, 20% of other sick physicians <laughs> transmitted their illness to physicians. So highlighting that you know, um, there clearly is this risk not only to patients, um, but also to other colleagues. And so in response to this question, do residents come to work sick? The answer is yes, they do. And um, this is even though they could harm patients and other personnel. So this actually has a harmful effect, not just for themselves, but for others. And why do they do it? Well, it's because they have a high degree of professional responsibility, and they don't want to burden their colleagues. And once again, residents are more likely to espouse these beliefs than interns. And so now in thinking about where are we going to go from here, so what, you know, what, what can we do about this? The first thing is just to summarize what do we know at this point. So residents continue to espouse a professional work ethic consistent with nostalgic professionalism. I and mean, that's what I hope everyone has taken away for this, is they continue to care for patients after duty hours have ended. They continue to um, not leave the hospital or lie about their work, um, and also work from home. And they also come into work when they're sick. And this is in spite of current policies that are in direct opposition to these behaviors. They continue to manifest these behaviors. And you might wonder, well, why is that? And so um, you know, I know that many of you in the audience have spent a long time thinking about this, um, as, and some of you with me. And as, um, as somebody who works with residents in a formal role, I can tell you that you can say all day and all night in orientation, you, know, you must leave the hospital at this time. But really, the culture and the hidden curriculum is going to be what they learn on the floor from their other peers, their other residents, the way the faculty respond to them, and the statement about strong work. And so the hidden curriculum is the implied set of values residents observe in their day-to-day -day interactions, which is far more powerful than the formal curriculum. And so, um, so this is an issue that we need to think about. So how can we um, you know, correct this? But before we correct it, we, I first want to highlight, is this a problem? Because some of you may think, great, residents espouse nostalgic professionalism. We're ready to go. And, um, and especially if you espouse nostalgic professionalism, which I imagine many of you do. And so one problem that I can think of is that um, when you have such a difference between expectation and policy, it's very likely that it leads to confusion and moral distress about how to act professionally. Most of the literature about this is in nursing regarding end-of-life care. So when nurses are forced to continue to provide aggressive treatments for patients when they personally don't believe that it's the right thing or they're concerned, you know, it leads to a lot of moral distress. So this, similarly, we're setting up our residents to, um, to to have a, uh, a belief system where their beliefs are in contrast with what they're being told to do. And more importantly, what, what if we're promoting other unprofessional behaviors? For example, is lying OK? Um, and so probably not. And if you're lying about your duty hours, then um, are you more likely to lie about your procedures? You know, Is it easy to just check boxes if you're just checking boxes about duty hours? I don't think anyone's answered that question. but. But I think one thing we need to think about is pause to say, how are we setting this, this up, the system up to reward people, and what does it reward them to do? And then most importantly, we set up a situation of these unrealistic expectations if, um, of trainees if the nostalgic framework is used by faculty teachers to evaluate professionalism. And so, um, and so this leads to what I will call generation bashing. And we've all seen this, where people will say, oh, this new generation of physician is unprofessional. And so can it really be the case that um, the medical students that we've selected and the residents that we are training in our current system are so unprofessional because of the system that, that has been forced upon them? I think that that's a question that we need to answer. Um, and so. So one possible response to this is let's just abandon nostalgia, you know, leave it off to the wayside and go for lifestyle professionalism. And actually, I was amazed in this um, Hafferty, Castellani and Hafferty article. This is their conclusion of the article, and this is what they state. Medical educators also need to realize that students and residents are likely to view physicians who practice a nostalgic professionalism as patronizing, <laughs> old-fashioned, outdated 
jaded and unhealthy. And so I know our medical students are, are smiling. And so maybe, maybe we're just too outdated for everybody. Um, and so I was pretty surprised by this very um, controversial statement that was made by them. And I'm not so sure we want to jump straight into lifestyle professionalism, because don't we all have concerns about shift work mentality? Isn't that why we started this conversation? So then I want to ask you, I want you to think of a shift worker. Think of a classic shift worker in your mind. Uh, we, you deal with them every day, you know, um, people in the police force, um, nurses, pharmacists. And are they all unprofessional because they are shift workers? And so I think that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. You know, is, is by virtue of being a shift worker, does that automatically make you unprofessional? I mean, everybody has to stop working at some point and be rested to go in the next day. And the second thing to think about is even people in the military, high degree of obligation, they have enforced rules around how often they should work. Now, I'm going to take nurses as a specific example. And the reason I'm going to take nurses as a specific example is they've been doing shift work for a long time. And I think we'd be hard pressed to say our nursing colleagues are unprofessional or exhibit shift work mentality. And in fact, what I'm going to argue is that they exhibit something else. They exhibit shift work professionalism, which we have not yet done in medicine because we don't know how. And so one of the things that you'll see in your nursing colleagues is, you know, nurses on the floor do not arrive late. They arrive on time. They are ready to receive a handoff at a specific time. They have respect for people's shifts. So they arrive on time, they use their time efficient and efficiently, and they leave on time. Now, of course, there may be a specific case where a nurse has to stay um, and care for a patient. But oftentimes, what you see is that they have a very um, rigid respect for the shift. The other thing that they do is they invest a lot in handoffs. And so you can't interrupt a nurse during a handoff. It's more than just a transfer of content. It's also a transfer of professional responsibility. Um, don't try to interrupt a nurse during a handoff. It won't work. Now, the other thing is that they have espoused a team approach to patient care, which has been a lot harder for us to do in medicine. I don't know a nurse that when you go up to the floor and they say, you know, if they're on the floor and if it's their patient that's assigned to them, they just received a handoff, they're not going to say that patient is not my patient. They might say I'm just coming on shift, I'm just learning about the patient, but they are assuming care for the patient. And so they have really espoused a teamwork approach where every patient they care for is their patient. And they've changed the definition of professional ownership where it's not just a single nurse to a single um, um, patient, but it's a unit. And so when one nurse needs to leave the floor, somebody else will cover, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, something that I think we all need to work on is collegial interactions across teams. And so in addition to team, uh, into a teamwork approach to care, should we be using a much more interdisciplinary team to care for patients that would provide a little bit of um, more um, uh, the ability to actually um, adopt shift work in a more professional way? Now, I want to just end with a little, few examples of where we have not, where we have adopted shift work, but perhaps where we're not doing as well as we could because we haven't adopted shift work professionalism. And so this is data that we actually collect uh, around handoffs as part of an ARC study um, looking at interruptions. And what's interesting is, you know, many people highlight pagers going off or, you know, um, cell phones, distractions. People think that pagers and intercoms, those are the most common types of distractions. And in fact, in fact, what we find in our studies around handoffs is actually the most common distractions come from people, either side conversations that are occurring, people venting about their job, or, um, you know, or having a personal interaction because they're happy to see each other, which speaks to the fact that we must provide a, a, um, a place, a safe place for people to actually vent and to have these safe conversations, but not at the time of the handoff. But the second most common disruption was clinicians arriving for the handoff. And so you might be wondering, well, how is that a disruption? Either they're arriving late, and so that's one possibility, or the shift is not structured in a setting where, where there's enough overlap time. And so everyone is always perceived as late because the person who's arriving at 7 and they want to start the handoff at 7, they're never ready to go. And so that's, that's kind of the idea that I'm talking about with shift work professionalism that we've had difficulty in adopting. 
Now, one of the things that we've argued for is, um, and actually I've t taught residents and students a lot about this, in response to this whole idea of um, generation bashing and, their res and that there are generations not professional, I say to them, you know, the handoff is your opportunity to be professional. And so as opposed to saying that's not my patient, you need to establish handoffs as a transfer of professional responsibility such that every patient is your patient and so that residents feel comfortable leaving the hospital and they're leaving the care of their patients in good hands. And so that's something that we've started to teach. Um, now, there are still a lot of areas to improve. I would say one area that we have not really improved a lot is the idea of teamwork and collegiality. And so um, in, in thinking about shift work and the way shifts should be structured and having collegiality, one of the interesting studies that we've done, and this work was done with um, Shalini Reddy and Holly Humphrey and Jeannie Farnan and a variety of others actually at um, Northwestern and North Shore, we've looked at actually what, what behaviors are, are become more prevalent? What unprofessional behaviors become more prevalent during internship? And a lot of people think internship, you know, everyone starts, um, you know, maybe disparaging patients or falsifying medical records or doing really egregious things. And the answer to that is no. Very few people actually espoused those behaviors. Few people did them before, few people did them after. The bad news is the same people who did them before did them after. And so there are a few bad eggs that we need to be cautious of. But the behaviors that actually went up during internship at these three hospitals that, um, that highlight what is the hidden curriculum were blocking admissions, disparaging the ER or primary care physician for missed findings that were later discovered, and then misrepresenting an ordered test as urgent to get it expedited. Now I want to focus on disparaging the ER or primary care physician for missed findings later discovered. Because if the residents are, you know, are shift workers and adopting a team-based approach, then this wouldn't be a behavior that we would be endorsing or espousing. So that's certainly an area that we wanted to improve. And uh, with a grant from the ABIM Foundation, we've actually developed a series of videos. Um, and we've conducted uh, video workshops for hospitalists at all three institutions, as well as residents. Um, and this is actually a sample vignette called Scoring on Call, which is all about trying to block an admission. But the poor resident here wastes more time blocking the admission than if they had accepted it and actually taken care of the patient. And, so, um, and then working through a debriefing exercise. So I don't have all the answers, um, but I just wanted to give you um, a foray into what some of the current thoughts that I had regarding duty hours and professionalism were. Um, and I think we have some unanswered questions that we could answer in this room um, and think about how to reconcile these problems. And the first is, how can we reconcile our definition of professionalism with this new world of resident duty hours? And I've, I've attended a lot of the um, McLean Ethics Seminars where we've talked a lot about professionalism, but sometimes it's as we talked about in that study for those Hopkins residents, it's too hard for them to put that into practice the way the system has been set up. And can those who are nostalgic embrace shift work professionalism? I don't know, you know, so that's a question that we need to answer. Um, and, and the way our system is set up, what tools are needed to promote evaluation of professionalism in this new world? Will it be that any resident who leaves their patient is automatically going to be assumed as unprofessional? What will we do about that? And then lastly, um, probably the most important is what is going to be lost. So I think one of the most interesting findings is, you know, um, in the New York, uh, in the Northeast region, they're less concerned about resident ownership. And so clearly we will evolve and people will come to accept new systems, but we need to pause and think, well, what really will be lost and left off the table in order to think about that? And the last thing I wanted to throw out here uh, before ending is that there's clearly something about being in residency that still espouses a very strong work ethic and nostalgic professionalism because as you've seen, all of, in all of the studies I've showed you, the residents are more likely to display these behaviors than interns. And I have a hard time believing that we admitted an entirely different class of people across these three studies in our nation. So there's something about the training itself in which case, in which they learn this. And so, we want to continue for them to learn that, but how can we have them learn it in a safe way where they're not exhibiting behaviors that are contradictory to the rules? Um, so with that, I'm going to pause and thank many people of who, are not li who are listed on the slide, and there are too many to name, so, um, so many of you know who you are. So thank you. Dr. Aurora's paper is open for comments and questions. 
Yeah, so I'm a shift worker, unfortunately, in the emergency department. So I, I thought that your last comments about shift work professionalism are, are quite apropos. And I would suggest that looking at it in the laboratory of the emergency department would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, we face these challenges every day with residents who are, whether explicitly or implicitly, forced to stay an hour or two after their shift because they no one will take their procedure that they're trying to sign out or, their, or they feel that they owe it to the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's an interesting place to look. Um, and I think we haven't developed a culture where we accept. Uh, I came from a training program in New York, and we would say the bell is ringing, literally. The bell is ringing. You're a ghost. Go. And, and when I moved to Michigan and I came here, that's not the same mentality uh, that, that occurs here in our emergency department. Aside from that, though, I actually wanted to kind of, one of the outcomes you're looking at is this ownership idea. And I want to take a step back and ask you to reflect on the fact that potentially all of us as attendings, the way that we set up education or, or our residents is that they have to know everything about their patient. And we pick them about their patient. But what about our ownership, right? I mean, the, the essential issue of education is what residency is for versus clinical servitude, right, always comes up. And we don't actually address that head on, right? Who's responsible? If my medical student needs to go for something or resident needs to go for something, is it my patient or you're supposed to know the patient? And, and I wanted you to address that because I think, do we think as, as, a, as attendings that we actually don't have ownership of our patients and we're less professional? I don't think anybody would say that, but when the resident does that, we would say the same thing. We wouldn't say the same thing. No, that's a great, those are great points. And I definitely want to highlight that uh, in New York, um, there's also an independent body that's paid to actually go and secretly surprise residents and program directors. And so I understand from my visits to New York that the threat of that is very powerful. And so um, while we have implemented duty hours in the rest of the nation, we have not implemented the monitoring that New York has, which many people have described as a problem because we have not gotten to the, where New York has been. Um, and then also regarding being an emergency room physician, um, I think that was a great uh, segue and I, didn't, I missed my chance to discuss the emergency room and labor and delivery, but those are both examples of shift work and I think we not, we're not going to dismiss our colleagues as unprofessional there. But if you notice those professions, they have handoffs and shift beginning and end rituals that are way more extensive than anything that you have in medicine where all hands are on deck and people are having dialogues and things like that. So we have a lot to learn from. Um, from our colleagues in those fields. Um, and then the last question about faculty involvement and ownership of patients is fascinating. And I think we will probably have um, more data on that um, and hopefully um, discussion when Shannon completes her study um, of what faculty uh, believe their level of supervision is and also what, what they are learning from the electronic medical record. Because we have seen anecdotally the electronic medical record has really changed some of the dialogue and the perceptions that the residents have of what the faculty know. It's not uncommon for them to be like, oh, you already saw that. And I'm like, no, I want to hear from you. You tell me what you saw so I understand that you know what you saw and that we can have a dialogue. And I think we are are seeing um, obviously with the supervision accreditation rules which I did not discuss that also came up in line with the duty hour rules in 2011 we are seeing greater involvement at the front line and I, I know that Jeannie and I have been involved in several um, programs advising them who are starting nocturnist programs where the hospitalist is actually not just um, there at night doing uncovered, but they're actually a dedicated teaching nocturnist, who, and their goal is to actually teach at night and ha help the residents through with their admissions and provide some of that level of ownership. And so I think the comments you raise are really important comments, and how long, from a patient safety perspective, can we get away with being like, oh, I was just the attending, ask the resident. I don't think, I think that those days are already over, and so we're gonna be forced to really take a larger ownership of, the, of our patients. What do you do in the time that you're away from mm -hmm. the hospital? And it's not just work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's not work, work. But you're also part of a family. Yeah. You may be a parent. And anybody with kids knows that that first year, you don't sleep a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are we supposed to, is, um, is the ACGME going to, recommend to the residents when they have children when <laughs> right. you know because um yeah it, it just you can't regulate the number Absolutely. of hours so. yeah well, and I should say, um, I don't believe the ACGME would do that, uh, but I uh, can't speak for them. But I, I will say that um, 
the, I did not mention the following, which is that in the rules it says, and you know, again, I don't know how these rules are operationalized, but these are the rules by which site visits are going to occur and citations are going to be given, that faculty at that institution must be role modeling appropriate work-life balance. And so, um, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I for one would fail at that rule. So, uh, so I think that um, we're probably going to need to have a more open dialogue about this um, and let our residents and be more effective and healthy role models. Um, and I do believe it will, you know, there has been discussion around attending duty hours. And so we should bring that up. And the discussion is occurring. And again, who knows how it will be monitored? Will people lie? Same sort of issues. But, um, but it may not be long until people are, are thinking more, we're thinking more like Europe. Terrific talk, and I, I also really appreciate this notion of shift work professionalism and how it relates to team-based care and so on. Um, but I wanted to ask you a kind of researchy question. Um, I, I reviewed a paper a few months ago where uh, it, was a, it was a qualitative study, just talking to residents about why they stayed late. Um, and one of the issues that came up I really hadn't thought about before, but it was this sort of tension in professional values um, with dedication to the patient being sort of exemplified by staying late, but also exemplified by staying late was being inefficient. Oh, that, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I, I hadn't sort of thought that through before, but it was interesting to me that, uh, that people didn't necessarily see staying late as always being uh, something you know, that was uh, a display of your dedication to seeing things through. Sometimes people, and this was, you know, reflecting on their colleagues. So the, the resident would say, well, yeah, I have some colleagues who occasionally stay late because they really need to. I have others who stay late all the time because they're really inefficient. Yeah, no, that's a great point, and I think anyone who's been involved with program administration or worked with a resident in this category has, has understood the issues of of, uh, of, of a resident who's not efficient. And um, one of the challenges that I think we face is in our current duty hour structure, we don't have a safe place to train somebody who's not efficient. They're really expected to be on the ground efficient from day one. Um, and so, and, we, and most programs do not have adjustable caps or things like that where there's a safer period to allow for, um, for reflection and learning because most people's efficiency actually improves dur during the year. And so it's interesting in that study that efficiency issues were highlighted. And I can imagine it's partly driven by the fact that many chief residents are now around the country say they've been forced to turn into police as opposed to being teachers. And so, um, so they often are on the wards, you know, trying to get the residents to leave the hospital. And so if you're always that resident who's labeled by your chief resident or program director as staying late, you're going to be, you're going to feel like, okay, they're not, you're getting that mixed message. Maybe your faculty's like, oh, great job staying, but your, your program leadership is not happy with you. And so I think that's what we're seeing is greater push to, um, to be more strict about these um, rules is what's playing out with the residents. I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Matt had said about the sort of inefficiencies and how and how this is really sort of an area where GME is really affecting UME, yes, right? So it's, right. I, I've heard you make the analogy that I love of that residency training is like the sandwich, right? And so when you smash a sandwich together, the stuff that squeezes out the sides is usually all of the fun of residency, but also all the education. And I know we've got a bunch of fourth years who are submitting their rank list this evening. And are we not doing enough to prepare them for internship? And in fact, could we be arming them with these skills so that they are out of the box ready to be interns? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in fact, a, a major hot topic on list hosts everywhere and um, one of the in surveys of program directors they've actually surveyed program directors to say what do you expect your interns to be able to do from day one and the, for, the top thing is to, to course, execute a handoff, to provide a sign out, execute a handoff, discharge. It's not procedures. It's not this other stuff. It's around communication and um, mechanics of, it, of doing an admission history and physical. And so that brings up an interesting question because as a fourth year student, um, you know, there could be a huge time that elapses between your last clinical rotation and then the point that you <laughs> arrive to your internship. And so, um, so many programs, many medical schools are now describing more fourth year curricula similar to our own to, to a boot camp to get, the intern to get people ready for internship. Um, the challenge for that is there's a, um, 
interesting dialogue, and I think Shalini knows more about this than I do, about whether the fourth year is actually should be getting rid of completely. And so, um, and so there are people in the room that are like, don't get rid of the fourth year, we need it. And then there are other people that are like, oh, they, people are just taking electives, it's not a big deal. And I can tell you as someone who's um, served as a career advisor, I think that would be a really bad idea to get rid of the fourth year since uh, people still need time for career decision reflection as well as advanced training we describe. And so, um, so the perception is that fourth year is just an unclaimed area. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Well, while so many of the um, studies in medicine tend to show a, a decline or deterioration in empathy, compassion, let, let's say professional attitudes, um, as medical education and training continue, the data you showed us on the difference between the interns, the first year residents, and the second year residents is quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I, I, find it, um, I find it very uh, uh, reassuring data uh, to think that here at last we, we see uh, th this commitment to, um, I don't know what, what's nostalgic professionalism, uh, commitment to the patient increasing as training goes forward. I, I would love to see that carried forward, perhaps into fellowship training and practice, to see if, if that, that, that's a remarkable trend and quite different from a lot of the earlier studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great, I mean, it's a great question and something we'll have to monitor, I think, with our first test case, with our new interns working 16 <coughs> hours, you know, how will, they, how will they change when they work a longer shift next year, you yes. know? Well, I want to okay. thank you for everybody. We, it was a wonderful thank you. presentation. Thank you.